Hi, I'm Ben Field, and this is the Hillsong Film and TV Podcast. Well, hold on a second. I'm going to need something a little more special for today's guest. I'm thinking something a little more epic. That'll work, because today I'm talking with film and TV music composer Ryan Talbot, whose career has seen him involved in films such as Kingsman, The Golden Circle, King Arthur, Legends of the Sword, just to name a few. People wanting to get into film scoring, they underestimate. You have to have a very thick skin and you can't be too precious about your work. Uh, you, You have to separate yourself from trying to musically impress too much uh, because when it comes to film it's not really about that when you're the director you're making a film and that film is your baby it's your film whereas the composer has to learn how to read minds we're not making our own music for a solo work or an album we're serving the purpose for the director's vision whether you're into music composing or not this podcast is going to help and inspire you as ryan brings amazing insights and stories from his incredible journey Hey, Ryan, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, So I'm interested. You're a composer. Um, You write some great tracks. Lately, you've been living in Los Angeles and fallen into somewhat some success, I guess, from an early childhood, those dreams and aspirations. Tell me a little bit about what were your aspirations as a child when growing up? I would say I was about 10 years old or so that I, I started really getting into soundtracks and which was probably kind of a bizarre thing for a 10-year-old. Um, but it started with when my dad brought me to see the movie Jurassic Park in theaters. And I remember the experience was, uh, you know, I took that experience home with me and I couldn't figure out why, I, you know, I didn't know what film music was at the time, but I knew it made me feel a certain way that I needed to explore more of what that was. I actually spent a while trying to remember the music I heard. Uh, I was first starting, I was around that time I was getting into playing the piano a little bit. My dad brought me, uh, bought me a little uh, keyboard, Casio keyboard, and I would go home and pretending I'm playing the Jurassic Park <laughs> theme, even though uh, I, I, for the life of me, I could not remember. It was actually bugging me because uh, I couldn't figure out what the notes were. And fast forward a few years later, I was at a bowling alley and I was playing uh, a pinball machine. And it was a Jurassic Park pinball machine and I heard the music. So I kind of freaked out. I was like, oh, that's it. Now I know what that note is. And I put my ear to the uh, pinball machine and I tried to remember it. And I went home and I played it. So I was hooked from then on out. Yeah. I, I was asked every Christmas, birthdays, I was asking for equipment, keyboards and whatnot. And... Uh, I would watch a movie, and then I would try to go and mimic what I heard, the music on the keyboard. I would try my best to copy and try to make it sound the same. And um, so throughout my teenage years, it was a lot of experimentation, a lot of trial and error. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I tried my best to copy what I heard with the keyboard I had. I mean, I would spend nights just on my headphones listening to soundtracks, absorbing it. And so I think it just kind of wired my brain to hear the orchestra and hear the individual instruments. I'd never had actual technical training at that time. Oh. I went to uh, music college out of high school, and I didn't even like it because I'd sit in music theory class, and they would tell me there's rules. This note can't go here. You have to move this note here. And I'm like, well, I like the way that other way sounds better. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, did, I didn't really like the uh, the kind of sterile approach to it. Mm. Um, it was just a bit too clinical. Mm. And because I didn't learn music that way from 10 years old, I learned right. it by ear. Right. Um, and I think slowly that whole process allowed me to get a job uh, working at a studio uh, right out of high school. 
and I was recording bands and I was mixing them. So in that process, I was such a newbie when it came to recording and mixing, but I was doing it anyway. Right. And I would listen to, I would do a mix and I would go and burn it on a CD and then bring it out to the car and just hear how terrible it sounded and bassy and I couldn't figure (laughs) out why. You know, so it was all these questions of why does this not sound like this, you know, professional record and and it was just constantly going layer by layer, you know, why why doesn't it this work? Why when I do this it does this and mm. yeah, it was I was kind of obsessed with it. And so that whole process working at the studio actually improved my composing abilities because I became a better mixer. So you've had this moment where you're inspired and you're learning and you're inquisitive and you're being trained you're training yourself through your through your ear, not so much a schooling. What steps did you take towards composing? At that point, was it a dream? You're like, one day I want to do this, or were you just really passionate to learn how to create those sounds? Yeah, I would say from the moment I got into film music, I always told myself that's what I want to do when I grow up. Mm. That's I want to be, you know, I, I want to be a film composer. Um, what did that look like at that point? Like, I mean, because it's when you say you want to do that, what pictures did you see that? looking like? What reality did you see yourself living in? Uh, Well, at the time, you know, for me, it it was it was very it was less production oriented back then. It was way more orchestral. So and uh, I, you know, I had the wrong image in my head, but for I couldn't foresaw the way it is today. But it's, you know, I thought I would be conducting an orchestra like John Williams or something, you know, very kind of old school. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's changed a lot. It's very production heavy now, but um, I think back then I just saw this very, I guess, easy, you know, you just show up, make a little music, you know, get an orchestra to play it. It's no problem, you know, make this beautiful music. And and then, you know, I, I guess as the years progress, you realize how bad you actually still are and <laughs> you still got a long ways to go. And, and, you know, start certain realities start to set in, you know, but I guess that's part of it then. So many people that compose music are looking for, uh, I guess, an X factor or an edge that creates them to be somewhat different. Um, Did you live by that or were you happy just to say, well, this is what these films are making, I can mimic that, I can copy that, and therefore I can try and make a career out of just doing what's already been done? Or did you focus on what is my sound? Yeah, I I didn't, I guess... I think I didn't, you know, through my teenage years, I didn't have a concept of, uh, I need to sound different. I, I just didn't know enough about that world. For me, I was happy with copying what I heard. And, you know, but, that, but of course, as a result, my stuff started sounding like other composers. And I thought, oh, well, maybe I can just combine everything I like about all the composers into a certain style. But I, it wasn't a conscious effort to, okay, I need an X factor, I need to sound different. Uh, that really didn't happen until uh, later on in life. But then it was all about copying. I was just, because I still couldn't, I was still learning about what instruments are going where and how to layer things and, you know, why when I create a, a French horn line why does it sound so weak compared to Hans Zimmer's French horn line right. you know whereas it's so it's so you're still trying to figure out how to get yeah. to the destination of that sound being the perfect sound that you right. that you heard in your ear yeah. does it does it ever reach a point i mean like you said where you realize that you had to kind of separate yourself out and i guess it, it becomes the passion in music but then understanding you have to create a brand at the same time, right? Like, what is mm. Ryan Tolbert going to be known yeah. for? What inspired you? Who were the people that you looked up to as being very different from the rest? And that's what was creating a, a pathway for them to reach yeah. success. 
I think over the years, especially, I guess, in my early 20s, I started noticing, okay, you know, a lot of soundtracks are starting to sound the same. Uh, still loved them, but I was starting to get so familiar and used to it that uh, anybody that came out with something that was innovative or different, it was, uh, I was like, ah, oh, you know, there's something interesting. You know, that's a whole new world I can step into now, you know. So I think kind of getting an original sound, it kind of happens organically, I feel like, depending on your experiences, who you've worked with. It's, um, I mean, some people tell me, oh, that sounds like Ryan Taubert, a track. And I'm like, oh, yeah, but that was inspired by this composer. <laughs> but somehow or another, over the years, it does morph itself into a certain feeling or sound. I mean, nowadays, music is so eclectic, you can hear almost any kind of style you want. So it's hard to, you know, in the 90s, composers, it was a little easier to come out and do something different because nobody else was doing things different. Right. But, you know, you got guys these days that are really, you know, pushing the bar, you know, guys like Trent Reznor and these guys that came from a whole different world than uh, film scoring. So they brought something new, uh, you know, and it was a result of their past experiences. You know, they were in certain bands. They were experimental artists, sound, uh, uh, electronic, and and you've got more artists doing music for films these days as well. Mm. Um, yeah, I think, you know, just from the projects I've worked on, even doing a lot of non-film stuff, uh, more commercial type stuff, uh, where I'm having to create uh, EDM or something like that, it's, it's, it pushes me uh, outside of my comfort zone. And then when I go back to scoring a film, I take some of those lessons I learned and, and apply it there, which kind of, I think it kind of, like I said, it's not a conscious effort. It just happens organically. Um, when, I, when I hear a melody or when I'm sitting down looking at a scene, what I hear in my head tends to be, I guess, reflect you know the past 10 years of work I've done and the people I've worked with, the people I've met, uh, places I've visited. So I think that all kind of comes into one thing, which right. I guess um, is originality in a, in, a, in a sense. Let me just rewind back a little bit. Big dream, small town, Hollywood film producing, having your music up there on the cinema screen, very far from the reality. What did you need to do to take that first step towards that goal and that dream? Yeah, the thing, it was hard because I didn't know anybody that was already doing it. I didn't know any other film composers. Uh, but then the internet started getting popular, you know, in the late 90s. And then it was just like, it was kind of a whole world. I started looking up uh, ads of people looking for composers. And and I was emailing, just, just sending random emails to all kind of people. Oh, hey, I can score your little indie film. Right. Um, so you were, you were putting your work out for free. Essentially yeah. saying, I just want to get the experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I didn't get any jobs from that. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Who doesn't want I, a free composer? That's crazy. <laughs> so I, I thought, okay, well, the way this is going to happen is I'm going to have to uh, get out of Fort Natchez, Texas. And that was just daunting to think about. I, I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I think, what was it about? 2004 or something I just kind of hit a place where I was just like ah oh, this might not happen I you know had to get jobs random little odd jobs just to pay rent and I was trying to look for an excuse I could to get out uh, whether go to California or something so yeah I think for me it was trying to make as much music as I could to get more experience but the hardest part was getting the ball ro rolling with some kind of momentum uh, of actually working on films. And there was also the fear that, look, you know, I may not ever make it to, I guess, where I always dreamed of making it. You know, I could, this might end up just being a little hobby. So it was, yeah, I mean, I went through a little rough patch where I was just, I even went to college, to a business school, but ended up dropping out after a year just because I wasn't interested. 
So yeah, it, it, it was kind of, I really didn't know uh, what to do. All I knew is I needed to keep making music. Then MySpace came and I had a music profile. I started putting music up and and um, yeah, I, I, I think that was how I got my first gig on a little short indie film that was done locally mm -hmm. uh, around the town that I'd lived in. Yeah. I mean, for a lot of people, you, you think there's an understanding that when you're coming from a small community and you have that big dream, that fear of leaving what's comfortable to achieve that dream did you feel fearful to be no, able to do that? No, uh, I actually didn't. I, was, um, I wasn't so attached to my home uh, for whatever reason. I was, I was desperate to get out. I was so excited for one day leaving. It's not that I had a bad experience or anything. It's just like I didn't want to work at a refinery. You know, uh, I would see people on TV or something, you know, people living in other places, other cities, and doing what they do and, you know, uh, I would dream about that kind of stuff, uh, leaving Texas or leaving Port Natchez, Texas. Uh, so, no, it wasn't hard at all, actually. So you, you're taking some steps forward. You're creating music in the mindset of just, just keep creating, keep creating, putting it out there. Um, were you hoping for certain people to pick it up or were you just hoping for anybody to pick it up at that point? Anybody, really. It, it was because I needed some kind of, I guess I needed some kind of sign that, okay, this could be a possibility. This could be a possible future career because, you know, uh, I was then 21, you know, uh, you know, time was ticking in terms of getting myself positioned in a way where it could open the door for future possibilities. Yeah. Uh, I had already dropped out of college. You know, I was working as a delivery driver for a deli um so uh it it was um yeah I, I was really hoping for anything to bite and was that journey did that seem to be doors opening or did that seem to be a lot harder than what you thought it was hard for a bit um but um i mean i think probably the best decision i ever made was leaving uh when i was uh, 2006 and I just decided, you know, I wanted something completely different. I needed to have a whole new experience just to see what else is out there. And I picked up and uh, moved to Australia, Sydney, Australia. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it was um, it just took a, a drastic effort, you know, for me to I think if I would have stayed there to this day, I would be working at a refinery. So like that. yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's just it's just what everybody does there. There's no other industry really. So the power in that one decision to move made all the difference. Yeah, I think uh, it helped release me of being at home as well. Um, it was really hard at first because obviously missing family and stuff like that. But the people I met, it was a whole new world. Uh, it was an interesting moment moving somewhere completely outside of my comfort zone but at the same time I, I loved every bit of it it's almost like I was waiting for that you know for throughout my whole teenage years I was ready to leave and I, I went as, as far as way as you could yeah so I think uh, yeah no I was ready for it though what do you find is one of the biggest hurdles in your work between good and great how big is that gap for you? Uh, laziness and procrastination. Because <laughs> uh, I can create something and then it's like, ah, oh, you know, uh, it works, you know. But uh, I need to spend one more day, about 10 or 15 more layers or something to make it great. But a lot of times that remaining 15, 10, 15% 15 can be the hardest because it's just, you know, tweaking it and tweaking, massaging it. So, but I think the, the solution to that was just to become quicker. The quicker I could get to something that's like at a 90% level, then it's not much energy to finish off the remaining 10. But if I spend ages on the first 90%, I'm worn out. 
and my brain is just, I've lost all, all objectivity. Hmm. So I think the solution to that is speed, getting faster. So recently, you've had a taste of that Hollywood experience from the young boy in Port Neches, Texas, with a dream <laughs> in his heart to compose Hollywood uh, film score, uh, and you received a, an unexpected phone call. Tell me about that. Yeah, so um, I was starting to license my tracks with uh, a trailer production house out of L.A., and I got a text from this company saying, hey... One of my friends is uh, the music director at, for Warner Brothers, and uh, she was looking to get in touch with you. I'm not sure what it's for, but I'll give her your number. So they called me up, and basically a track that I had done for a short film, I think a, a visual effects artist out of London just kind of needle-dropped it as a temp and a scene for Guy Ritchie's King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. And it was in the main scene where he pulls the sword out of the stone. And they had already had a composer on it for a year or so. So they called me up. They said Guy has basically, he's gotten stuck on that track. They tried different things, but it's not quite working. Um, so they initially was asking me, can, can I maybe do something to either work with a composer that was there or try to make it work for that scene. So they ended up flying me to London uh, for a few days just to meet up with Guy, um, just to kind of get a feel for what's going on with uh, the scene. Uh, what ended up happening was uh, we came back to U.S., but then they flew me back out with no return date. Um, so it was just I'm going and I'm staying in uh, Soho, London. I've got my rig set up in the hotel room and the edit suite is just down the street from the hotel and what turned into one scene turned into the whole film at the time it, it, they were just throwing different scenes at me so it turned into redoing that track but also doing original stuff for the other scene so that was a very <laughs> that was my first time to experience such a uh, thing and I, I learned a lot in the process. It was very tough, um, and you know I feel I I do feel bad for the uh, the composer that had worked a whole year on the film. Uh, it was so chaotic because they were trying to finish everything up, visual effects, sound design, all at the same time, and the edit. And it, it was just so chaotic that not a whole lot of time was being given with the score, but. Um, yeah, it was just it was it was it was a circus. It was a very interesting experience. Yeah, well, it's exciting. I mean, especially when you think about the journey you were on and how that opportunity comes out of the blue like that. Um, I'm interested to know, like the the dream that you had as a kid in Texas. Fast forwarding to many, many, many years later, and you're you've got your set up in a hotel in London, walking down the street to the edit, dumping tracks, working overnight in this mm -hmm. kind of circus setup. Did that disillusion you about the whole process of what Hollywood Absolutely. is? Absolutely. I mean, it was, I realized how brutal it can be and how much I still had to learn. I mean, I went in, uh, did the best I could. I mean, I was, I wasn't giving a lot of time because there was already a score that had been done for it, but they were trying to bandage a few things and right. I was the guy that the way was falling on at the time so it, with you know only had a few weeks to come up with magic you know so uh, it was it was rough um, and I appreciate what I learned from it but the one thing uh, one thing that 
what makes it a bit difficult is because when you're the director, you know, you're making a film and that film is your baby. Like it's it's your film. Mm -hmm. Whereas the composer comes in and the, the composer has to learn how to read minds. We're not making our own music for a solo work or a, an album. We're serving the purpose for the director's vision. And that is the hardest part because it's me trying to get in the director's head and read his mind on what he's wanting. And I would say that's the most difficult thing. That That's why, you know, if you're trying to get to point A and B, it's never a straight line. It feels like you're going all around the whole thing before you arrive at your mm -hmm. destination. You go the long way to get there because it's it's trying to figure out everything the director hates before you get to something he right. loves, you know, so... Um, Is that soul-destroying? I mean, when especially when you put something forward that you're like this is great like this is some of my best my best work i'm in the zone and it can be thrown in the trash as quick as it is put yeah. on the timeline that that is one thing i would say that uh people wanting to get into film scoring they underestimate you have to have a very thick skin and you can't be too precious about your work if 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 it was that way it'd be better for me to go and just be a solo artist and release albums um, but I have to almost be numb uh, to my work to and be willing to, even if I think it's great, but the director might be like, it's the worst thing I've ever heard. You know, I go in the bin straight away and then you get fired over one cue. Some, some composers, that's the way it is, uh, even before they get a chance to do revisions. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's very... Uh, it's very cutthroat, and it's it, you cannot, you can't be too precious and and love your own work too much. Mm. When does it cross the line between staying true to the artist within you and and composing for music and the beauty of that, and when all the business strings get attached? Because anybody that's great at music wants to make it a career. The dream yeah. is that they compose every day and they're making a lot of money out of it, or making enough to survive. Is there a line where it gets dangerous between? Um, serving for the outcome, you know, means to an end. Um, how do you how do you balance that? It can be hard for some people if you're more um, if you're 100 percent business with it, or if you're 100 percent it's for the art. Uh, if you're one of those, it can be very tough because it's hard to find that balance between the two. But I do believe you have to have a balance. So I'm. I try my best to keep a sense of musical integrity in terms of what I feel is what I'm trying to represent about myself. But at the same time, I have a job, and I'm not working for myself. I'm working for somebody else's project. Right. And there is the business side of it uh, that I personally don't have a problem with. So I find it a little easier to balance the two because uh, sometimes it is business. Sometimes it's you're being asked to make the most cliche, um, on-the-nose thing you can possibly think of. Mm. And you don't say no, you just do it. Mm. And it's unfortunate, a lot of, you know, a lot of composers would get the blame, say, if the score just sounds so unoriginal, not realizing that it's usually coming down from them copying the temp because the director's in love with the temp, and right. maybe the temp was just stock standard. Right. But... That's okay because that's the way the business is. Yeah. Uh, you you have to separate yourself from trying to musically impress too much uh, because it's not it's not when it comes to film it's not really about that as much. Mm -hmm. I mean it's great if they they work together and, and you are allowed the room to be creative. And some project projects are like that, uh, but then oh, some aren't. And you have to be okay with that. Yeah, yeah. If, if that's what you, if yeah, if that's say what I want to do with my career, then I have to be okay with mm -hmm. that. I think I've, it personally, when I've watched films, and I haven't noticed the score, if somebody was to say, "Oh, what did you think of the score?" Um, and I remembered everything about it, it would have been because I got lost in these cues that were overpowering the story right. at that point, yep. where music should be. Underneath the story should be enhancing those moments yeah. or giving breath to those dramatic moments, not driving them. Yeah. There's different approaches to scoring a scene, but I do remember something Guy told me 
One of the reasons why he liked the track that was Tempt In, and we were sitting in the edit, and he looked at me and he said, you didn't do that track to a scene, did you? I said, no, I didn't, actually. I made it, and the scene was cut to the music. And he said, I can tell. So he said his biggest problem with composers is composers try to compose too much. They try to do something beautiful where it hits the cuts just right, and it's just it moves with the story. Right. Where he he likes it to be less composed. He likes a track to be uh, a bit more functional, uh, less musical, and driving through certain scenes, but not changing around too much. Mm. You know, if 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 I start something, say a big drum hit, you know, and then it there's another hit and then another hit. And then I bring these big, beautiful strings in. He's like, ah, wh- what happened? I'm, was, I was, you had me with the drum hits, and then right. now I'm out of it. Right. <laughs> so uh, it was a very interesting approach. He was like, don't, don't mix a bunch of stuff together, uh, you know, because I would have all these different subtle layers floating in the background. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's like, I don't want anything floating don't around. Don't overcomplicate it. Yeah. 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 Every layer that you put needs to know what it's doing. Right. It needs to be confident. So a layer comes in, boom, that's it. There's nothing floating around in the background. And then another layer comes in on top. But every layer has a purpose and it knows what it's doing. There's wow. nothing that's just kind of, you know, floating around in the background. Mm. So it's a very interesting approach, but that was part of the learning experience for me. It, it's not that that is the way to score a film. It's just a different way right. of thinking about it. And I, I personally like it. Um, I always like trying new things and approaching it differently. So, uh, yeah. And as a composer, it's actually so hard. When you've grown up listening to orchestral music right. scores, I mean, you're mm. talking about Jurassic Park, Titanic, it was Braveheart, and all these, uh, it's hard to get that out of your head. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that that's the biggest challenge. few years ago, um, you had the opportunity to meet Hans Zimmer mm-hmm. and do something in his studio. Tell me about that. Well, I uh, there was this, it was a composing competition, which I placed in the top three. So I was went out and uh, met with Hans at his studio in Santa Monica. But uh, not too long after that, I ended up moving to LA and getting an office at Remote Control in Santa Monica at his studios. So I had an office there for a few years. So it was it was good because, you know, I got a chance to work on a few of the projects. Um, I helped out uh, Matt Margiston, the composer for, and Henry Jackman for uh, Kingsman, The Golden Circle. I did some scene, uh, a scene for that. So I learned a lot in that process as well. Um, so working with some of the guys there was really helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I no longer work in that office now, but uh, it was a good it was a good experience mm-hmm. while I was there. So, for those starting out, what would be the advice you would give to those who maybe are living in that Port Neches, Texas kind of world, who are musically inclined and have a vision for what they could be doing one day? What things would you say to them to help them get started? Really, the first thing I can think of is you need to make as much music as possible. Years ago, when I thought I was ready to come to L.A. and score a film, uh, now that I'm here, I'm like, wow, I'm glad I didn't come when I thought I was meant to go right. because I wouldn't have made it. Yeah. So uh, you don't realize how much more you need to improve until years later and you listen back to your old work. Mm. When you think you're ready, you're not. It's uh, The most important thing is to keep making as much music as possible. Fail at it as many times as possible. You know, trial and error. Get it critiqued. Uh, get it very bluntly critiqued as well. And, um, and put it out there online. You can even release music on iTunes and Spotify yourself. 
a lot of questions that feel like similar questions that I had in my earlier stages, almost thinking that maybe there's a list of rule of thumbs or, you know, ways of doing things. And I'm like, well, you know, oh, how do you make your percussion sound like that? You know, oh, okay, you do that every single time. And I'm like, oh, no, I just did it for that track. Right. So you have to learn the intuition on how every mm -hmm. piece of music is different. And I can't, that can't be really taught. The only way it can happen is if you make as much as music as possible for the next 10 years and get over 200 tracks at least. From Well, that's about how much I did from teenage years until now. And uh, <laughs> I listened to some of my early stuff and I was like, wow. It's just I definitely wasn't ready then. Mm. But I didn't improve by anybody showing me a better way of doing it. I improved. It's The ear is like a muscle. Mm. And even without you knowing it, if you keep making music and putting it out there every year, you do get better as long as you've got people critiquing it. Awesome. Ryan, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Well, this track you're listening to, along with all the others featured in today's podcast, were written and composed by the very talented Ryan Tolbert. You can listen to Ryan's music and even license his tracks for your own projects by heading to musicbed.com. I hope you're inspired by today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or our YouTube channel to make sure you get the latest episodes as soon as they're released. And you can also follow us on social media at Hillsong Film TV. Lastly, I'd love to give a quick shout out and thank you to my co-producer and the man behind the desk, Josiah New, and I look forward to being with you again next time on the Hillsong Film and TV podcast. Mm -hmm.